Before we get started, I'd just like to give my sincerest thanks to Raymond for his suggestion of this week's movie. He chose pretty damn well, and I'm really glad I was introduced to this film. So Raymond, thanks a lot. And if any of you are looking for a fun set of movie reviews, go and check out his channel. He's got some awesome videos over there. Anyway, on with the show. It's not very often that I'm introduced to a movie quite like She. In fact, it's not very often that movies like She get made. The title alone is frankly a little bit confusing, both in terms of how I grammatically use it in this review, and in terms of helping people to find this movie. Before the days of the internet, I'm sure you could go into a video store, ask for the movie called She, and vaguely explain the plot, and have it dropped right in front of you. But as it stands in the 21st century, googling She brings up millions if not billions of results. Even with a basic plot added alongside the title, both the IMDB listing and the Wikipedia article for this movie are woefully short and contradictory. One of the biggest problems being that no one seemingly knows when this film was actually made and released, with IMDB listing the film as being released in 1984, YouTube listing it as a 1982 release, and Wikipedia's article on this is titled She 1982, but with the opening line, She is a 1984 Italian English co-production. Only further muddy in the waters, at the end of this film's end credits, it says the film was made in 1983. So if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that the film was released in Italy in late 1982, before being repackaged and sold internationally in 1984. But we may never actually know. The movie was based on a novel by H. Ryder Haggard, a quite famous novelist born in the 19th century, who had quite a body of work, typically quite heavily sci-fi based. The novel was adapted and directed by Avi Nesher, an Israeli filmmaker who predominantly specialised in producing and directing. While he currently holds more production credits than he does directing credits, at the time of writing at least, literally he has one more production credit than he does a directing credit, he's seemingly very well known in his home country, with several successful productions, including Rage and Glory and Time Bomb. His writing ability is quite limited, but I had assumed that with the film being based off of a novel, most of the legwork had pretty much been already done, so with this in mind it felt like going into this like I was in for a fairly reasonable experience. She takes place in a post-apocalyptic world, set 23 years after an event called The Cancellation, which here is a euphemism for the apocalypse. It took me a moment to click, but I realised fairly early on that this film isn't playing the film from the perspective that it takes place 23 years after 1982, 83, 84, but rather 1982, 83, 84 is the present day in this film, and that the cancellation happened in 1959, 60, 61 which I thought was some quite nice timing, as setting the apocalypse in that time frame meant that it had some grounding in reality, what with tensions over the Cold War still quite high at that time. It made it feel somewhat more believable, and seemingly jumped on the retro post-apocalypse 50s vibe that the Fallout series was known for a good 10 to 15 years before the first Fallout game was even made. It seems somewhat grounded, at least at first. The film follows Dick and Tom, two friends who live in a colony that survived the cancellation. When raiders turn up to the town one day and kidnap Tom's sister, Tom and Dick decide to give chase to the raiders in an attempt to rescue her. 
However, on the way, they're tricked by a woman into some sort of slavery? It's not made all that clear. Anyway, it turns out Tom's being sold to a religious sect who worship she. A goddess who reincarnates into a chosen woman's body every few decades. And it just so happens that a new she is being chosen at the exact moment Tom enters the picture. Tom is initially tortured and left for dead, but he's rescued by a scientist who heals him and after rescuing Dick, the pair return to the temple and kidnap she, in an attempt to use the goddess's powers to help in rescuing Tom's sister. After a falling out with a gang of mutants dressed like mummies, however, the group are rounded back up. She decides to let Tom and Dick go, only to then change her mind about letting them go on their own. So she decides to follow and help reclaim Tom's sister with the help of her assistant. And thus a giant adventure begins, as our team travel the full lengths and wastes encountering strange and unusual survivors, various other gangs who follow different gods, and creatures all with their own abilities in this campy post-apocalyptic action thriller. The opening moments of this film are a tiny bit misleading, really. The film opens with hand-drawn, artistic, Pulp Fiction-esque cartoons of various monsters and demons. And although well-drawn, it could be said that these are very tenuously linked to the actual film itself. I mean, this film does feature mutants and demigods with unusual powers, but very few if any of them look like any of the kind of haunted house abominations that are shown in the drawings at the beginning of this film. Also from an aesthetic standpoint, one of the things I loved about this movie was the fact that the rival gangs, barring the main gang of raiders, all seem to be influenced by the Universal Monster movies with there being several unusual factions, such as the aforementioned gang of mutant mummies that are wandering the landscape aimlessly, and in the caves where she becomes reincarnated near the beginning of the film, there are several night-like characters who are revealed to be heavily inspired, if not literally variations, of Frankenstein's monster. There are also inferences to Dracula and the Wolfman throughout this, and the fact that, if my theory is correct, the cancellation happened in the 50s, it's a really nice touch, as monster movies like this and the creature features were really still riding high at that point in time. Of course, it would also stand to reason that the biggest, baddest group of raiders in the wastes would be heavily inspired by the Nazis what with World War II having only ended about 15 years before the cancellation would have happened. When this film isn't directly referencing movies, and it will directly reference a lot of movies, particularly one character at least will in the third act, it's playing around with the idea of how history will survive beyond the apocalypse. The answer in this film's case is there would be a massive jumble of misunderstandings of why we retain history, with multiple groups and factions appearing in this film dressed in several different historical styles, including, but not limited to, the Romans, the Greeks, and the Georgians, and several more as well. Some of these even cross styles matching one period of clothing with another, this film is full of stuff like that, just little touches that help in keeping me engaged, and small touches that give this film a quirkiness. One of the big ones that stuck in my mind was near the beginning of the film, when our heroes first rock up in their settlement. There's literally a blink and you'll miss it shot of a bartering table that's full of old world tins and cereal boxes, with people clambering for bran flakes. Apart from the fact that the food would have most likely completely perished at this point, I really had to smirk a bit at the tone the director was going for in doing stuff like this. I'll get the worst elements out of the way first and foremost. The script for this movie is terrible from a structuring perspective. The dialogue's not great either, but at least it has its moments. But the structuring of this script is really truly abominable. 
We open without learning any of the characters' names or motives, or even whether they're good guys or bad guys. And for at least the first 20 minutes of this film, I was certain that this must have been a sequel to something. Because I had the vibe that all these characters had already been established and set up. And looking around online, I found that while this wasn't a sequel to any other film, it was in fact the third remake of this film to be produced, with a version being released allegedly as early as 1925. The first two acts of this film, and a good chunk of the third, could be best described as They get captured, one of the team is taken away from the main group, the team look like they're about to die, the separated free member realises their friends are about to die and destroys the entire operation, everyone is free, they move on and immediately get recaptured. And pretty much from about the 15 minute mark until the last 10 minutes of this movie, that's the whole film. I mean, I realise that this is quite a common trope, but with other films I've seen, there's usually at least some kind of effort to differentiate these sequences, to make them stand out a little bit, to change things up a touch. But no, not here. Here, it's literally the same thing over and over again, three, maybe four times, followed by the big ending. It's repetitive, uninspiring, and had it not been for the elements within these sections, such as the bizarre characters, the occasional quippy dialogue line, or just some really strange thematic choices, I'd have gotten really, really bored with this film very quickly. When this film finished, my first thought was that, with one or two very minor nude scenes removed, this would be an absolutely excellent choice for the MST3K riff tracks treatment. If that gives you some idea about the tone and style of this film, then there you go. The only other majorly negative thing I can say about this is that the editing here is border offensive. There are moments where the film just hard cuts midway through a shot to something completely unrelated. In particular, one of the scenes that really got me was in the opening, where the woman drugs Dick and Tom. There's a shot of her standing up to stir a food pot, she starts to pour in the drug, and then there's a hard cut that's really jarring and very out of place. And this happens multiple times throughout the film's runtime. I don't know whether scenes have been removed as part of censorship, or whether they just didn't get a particularly great editor in for this one. But either way, 80% of this film is just very badly cut. Its pacing's all over the place, and it's a real issue, particularly in the first act, due to there being multiple plot lines, which meant I became absolutely lost in terms of figuring out what exactly was going on. I mean, I was able to piece it all together by the end of the first act, but with good editing this shouldn't have been a problem in the first place. It was just really awkward to manage here. The cinematography here isn't too bad really, it doesn't do too much in the way of being creative, but it's decent enough. It uses a pretty nice variety of shot types and compositions, and you can really tell that thought has gone into trying to visually put across this film to the best of its ability. There are a few sequences that look a bit better than the rest of the film, particularly the scenes in the Mad Doctor's oxygen tent and the big Nazi finale, but yeah, for the most part this is pretty above standard to be honest. Don't expect your socks to be blown off and you'll probably really enjoy the visuals here. As mentioned earlier, the acting is a bit on the spotty side, and spotty would probably be a bit of an understatement really. I'd say there's a 70-30 split between performances being all the shades of eccentric and schizophrenic, and the remaining performances being overly cheesy and just plain bad at times. This has a knock-on effect of creating a very unusual tone for the film, with actors who are giving very hammy, unbelievable performances having to work with other actors who could best be described as Daffy Duck from Looney Tunes. I actually really liked this mix though, 
It was so surreal and unusual that I actually found myself warming to this strange concoction of performances. So I'd say while it's far from the best acting in the world, chalk me up as having enjoyed the performances in this one. Much like the acting, the effects here really are a game of two halves too. With special effects such as glowing eyes and lasers actually being handled remarkably well for a lower budget early 80s film. In fact, when I saw the lasers in this film, I was somewhat impressed at how well they'd managed to integrate them, considering the quality I'd seen so far from a scripting and acting standpoint. The practical effects, however, are a bit disappointing with fake limbs looking really properly rubbery and one or two shots of people being thrown off bridges that look truly ridiculous. I'm not a big computer generated effects fan, I'll usually tend to value practical effects much more over computer effects, but here I'd have to say the opposite is the case, because frankly some of the practical shots look absolutely dire. In terms of direction? Well, much like the cine, it's not half bad. It takes a hell of a long time to really get going and establish its own style, but I feel by the time we hit the second act, it's more or less there. I'd say the best way to describe this film's direction is lumpy. There are sequences where the cast seem very uninterested, and there are scenes that just feel lifeless. But then contrasting this, there are equally sequences that hit every right note and in some regards could even surpass many mainstream films that were produced around the time. With the cast being sharp, witty and energised in these scenes and the director seemingly really getting into a creative flow of things, there's some wonderful arrangements of cast and setting to create some very visually striking works. Seriously, if you can make it past the somewhat drab first act, the rest of this film's pretty consistently good direction-wise. Finally, I have to mention the fight sequences, which, for the most part, are very creative, if not necessarily well executed. On the one hand, I really have to applaud the film for really pushing the boat out in terms of trying to get creative with how to use props and framings. Indeed, there are a wide variety of weird and wonderful props in this that make an appearance. My favourite being the very brief use of an umbrella in one of the fight scenes, which was a quite refreshing break from the usual standard fight scenes. There was also a sequence in which a woman was shot through the knee with an arrow attached to some string, who was then dragged by a bleeding arrow wound out of the village via a horse. That was very impressively handled. Where these fight scenes do fall down, however, is the uh, striking distances, which for the most part lean a little too wide for my taste. They really do seem to miss contact with each other quite frequently. And when they aren't utilising the items around them in interesting ways, it can be a touch generic for my taste. But the demigod fight scenes are all fun and creative, so they're definitely worth tuning in for. So with the bulk of the main points out of the way, I thought it best to round this review off with a few loose end pieces that either I don't have a tremendous amount to talk about, or that I found while researching this film that don't seemingly fit in anywhere else in this piece. The soundtrack is amazingly good, like ridiculously stupidly good for this kind of a film. And it's incredibly memorable. It's funky and catchy, and the main theme of this film was composed by a member of the Moody Blues. I was really surprised at just how good this OST was, and I can't believe that it hasn't been given more of an airing. If you can find the soundtrack on YouTube, go and listen to it. It's great. Technically, there is a sequel to this film, though not necessarily directly for this film in particular. In 1965, the movie The Vengeance of She was released, and by modern standards it would be considered a soft reboot of the novel that this film is based on. So that's terrifically confusing. The film hasn't really had anything in the way of a substantial home video release, it almost certainly came out on VHS, but I'm having trouble finding any evidence of a copy of it. 
and it was released as a Region Zero DVD in Italy a number of years ago, though that's now out of print and unavailable to purchase. And other than that, this film's languished in relative obscurity. I started this movie under the impression that I'd missed something. It felt like a sequel to a movie I hadn't seen. In fact, at first, just to help with how jarring this was, I jokingly pretended that this was a sequel to Threads that was set in America. But by the end of the film, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised. Reasonably good cine and direction married to a kick-ass soundtrack and a fun, if not terrifically messy script, made this a very enjoyable watch. A subversive, if not slightly plodding, ending only further endeared me to this production. It can be a bit slow in places, and the editing is frankly a joke, but this is some prime and enjoyable schlock at its finest, that I'm genuinely surprised hasn't been picked up for more attention by the cult collective. I say check it out. <laughs>